Okay, so. Hey, Tammy, how are you? I'm doing really well for a Monday. And you, Dr. Rob? Well, we have had so many clients coming in and so much work that's going on. I can't wait to go there tomorrow and and get into it because I'll be there a couple of days this week. And, um, you know, they do say that they get robbed when I come and work with them, which means I am challenging them. And that's really my job. So I look forward to it. Yeah, but but it it's never from a place of malice. It's always from like this is how we change. Is you know doing the same old thing again and again is you know doesn't change anything. We have to do things differently. So we have to be able to look at in a safely cocooned environment, you know what's going on, so that we can heal. I I often say, um, I think the garage at the house is full of trash bags of shame and toxic emotions that they get to leave with us and then they get to go home and be different and and I hear that often so so I'm always hopeful um it's a process and there's a, a reason why we're a 14 21 or 28 day program because there's different lengths of stay but I love the work that the clinical team is doing and I'm grateful that you're you're there even a little extra you're always there but you're there a little extra right now well a few days a week now but uh, Tammy I do want to say just quickly that I heard a story today that really Really bothers me and I think I'm going to write a blog or do a podcast about it which is you know if you have a sore on your finger and you put a band-aid on and some antibiotic and it's not getting any better you know you need to go see a specialist to see if you've got melanoma you know and uh and I just had an experience today of talking to a really lovely lovely couple who has been trying truly to get these things resolved but they've been seeing, you know, the general practitioner, the person who would know how to give them a Band-Aid. And, and I think that many therapists are well-meaning, but if you're not an expert in this work, and I really mean this, if you're not an expert and you're seeing just whoever, as nice as they are, as engaged as they may be, you really need to know what you're doing here. Uh, Tammy used to be involved with the training of these folks. I think most of the people in our field, I've touched in some way with training or books and stuff. And you need that in order to do this work. You don't want a general clinician. We are the nicest people in the world, but we also only know how to do what we do. And sometimes we will fit into a box, everyone who comes along, and, and it just doesn't work for people who have a specialized problem. So if you aren't seeing someone who knows what they're doing, please get a consultation or support. And in this case, I will say that what was really sad to me, Tammy, is that um, the therapist who was seeing really had a codependent lens. And so they blamed the spouse you know you're not this enough you're not that enough for the the husband's problems and you know she was losing her mind literally because she couldn't figure out what she had done wrong and the truth is she hadn't done anything wrong she just lived with a really troubled person so um you know if you think we sound like we know what we're talking about hopefully we do and you will seek us out to find a therapist to find treatment to get education you know that is our job so thank tammy thank you for letting me spout all that i just felt well, really sad i'm gonna tag on to that because i yeah i i talk to lots of people and i can't tell you how many times a partner is calling me and they're going into codependent and i and i stop them i interrupt them and say wait nothing you did or did i mean i go and often they'll start crying because they've been told over and over again that they are part of the problem and it just isn't the case and it and it doesn't help them but it also doesn't help the addict who gets to blame somebody else rather than right. taking ownership and changing things you know like there's an opportunity for change that's you know the message of hope is we can learn we can change but you know i i often use the you know if you've got cancer you go to the cancer specialist you don't go to your wonderful gp who you love for like normal things like flu shots you know you go where you get the specialized help and that's what i know our clinical team does so the first and, question and before you get got, to questions i know you want to get okay. through every one of them but i do want to follow up for the spouses which is okay for those of you who are partner of a spouse partner of an addict, no matter male, female, whatever you are, I really want you to write this down. I say this to everyone I work with individually who is a partner or spouse. You know, I do these consultations for a couple of hours. I meet with them. And I often have to say the following. And feel free to quote me for the spouses. And I say, please write this down. There is nothing you have ever done. There is nothing you can ever do. And there is nothing you will ever do to cause this problem. There is nothing you have done. There is nothing you are doing. And there's nothing that you will do. 
that to cause this problem or to escalate this problem. I, I understand many of you spouses have turned into someone that they don't want to be because of all these things that are happening. I understand that sometimes you feel ashamed about your yelling or your demanding or your shutting down. And what I want to say to you is that if your partner had trouble with you, they can leave you. They can get a divorce. They can go into therapy. They can take up a hobby. There are so many things that somebody can do when they're unhappy in their relationship other than go use porn or see a stranger or have an affair. That is that person's choice to do that. Just like any alcoholic will say, oh my God, well, I'm drinking because of this, that, and the other thing. The truth is there are many things that someone can do other than get drunk. If they're having a hard time, uh, there is everything in the world that your addict can do when they're having a hard time. And it is completely unfair for an addict to put responsibility on a spouse. Their unhappiness, you know, again, they are responsible for their unhappiness, but you are never responsible for making somebody decide how they're going to deal with whatever's in their life. So thank you, Tammy. I just feel it's really important for the spouses and to reinforce that they are not responsible for this problem. They are not contributing to this problem. They are living through it. So thank you. I, I appreciate we we'll won't get to all the questions, but I hope that that was helpful for all of you. Okay. Let's okay. So take the it first on. one on. is easy. The, when is the next inner child? I looked it up July 5th. It starts and it's on, and I put the link in the chat, but for those of you watching on YouTube, it's on uh, the seekingintegrity.com site under work groups, inner child, the attachment wound, out of the doghouse. Uh, I don't have the next betrayed partner uh, set up yet, but we've got the next couples. We The Porn Addiction 101 starts again on June 18th. Sex Addiction 101, we start that again. And I don't remember the date, but check. They're always on, you know, on the workshop or work group link, a tab on the Seeking Integrity site. So, a quick question, so check Tammy. that out. Is the inner child work shop open to both spouses and addicts or is it only for no this addicts? is for addicts yeah this okay. is this is this is eddie caparucci's work um of going Which deeper people love yes but but steven uh line out who has trained with eddie is going to take um take over that because eddie's developing another work um group for us which will de Great. debut this fall so so more to come okay next question I was wondering if you could talk about how sex addiction harms the entire family and how it affects other aspects of their lives. Thank you. And thanks to Tammy for her endless patience with my emails. You're welcome. So, but. Well, I, I don't know how Tammy would put this. I, I think again, this came up, comes up often when I do these consultations and in treatment is, so this is the example that I have. There may be others. Um, I will often ask uh, someone who is the a sex addict in a partner relationship where they have kids. I'll say, you know, do you think you've been a good parent? And they will say, oh, yes, you know, I help them with their homework and I used to show up for games and if they did. And the problem is, is that being a good parent is not simply about what you provide your children. It's also about what you provide your spouse. You know, if I am someone who is raising two kids and I feel anxious and unheard, and like, I'm not sure what's going on and blamed for someone else's behavior. I can't be the best mom or dad I can be. So one of the direct ways I think it hurts families is that if you're not present and available and supportive of your partner, then they're not able to be the best parent that they can be. Not to mention the fact uh, what, you know, when there's tension in the home or they're arguing all the time or kids don't have good role models, you know, all of that contributes. But I think the biggest sin, if you will, is not doing your job, which is to protect your family, everyone in the family. And uh, yeah, that would be my thought. Tammy? Uh, 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 it, it, <laughs> I know, well, it's one. like addict, no, but it's addiction, whatever form it takes, uh, affects the entire system. Like the person is not engaged in, in real, I mean, like there, you cannot live in integrity. You cannot be fully present. If you're at your kid's baseball game and you think you're a good dad because you're at the baseball game, but you're, you're swiping and you know, what I mean, like, or thinking about, you're never really present. I mean, addiction in whatever form takes you away, gives you an escape outlet. So you aren't experiencing real emotions, real deep connection. So, so whatever form of addiction it is, you know, sex addiction is a form of, a, of you know, problematic behavior, but 
And then, you know, like, and it isn't contagious. It's not like the kids are going to catch this, but, but that disconnect that, well, no, but like, but, but, you know, that the world isn't safe, that there isn't uh, the bandwidth by parents, whatever it is, you know, can be, you know, adult children of alcoholics, there's a group for them because, you know, because they have not gotten the nurturing and, and that they need. So, so now if, you know, if one person is, is able to be present, can the kids get enough? Yes. So it isn't, you know, like your kids are not all going to grow up. But if the person is supposed to be supporting them, isn't there, is there, but not there, that's a whole, you know, you can raise a kid by yourself, but if there's expectations on a partner that they simply do their job and they're not met, then it's going to be a whole different deal. Um, And Tammy, I do want to say, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say the entire family system, but it can be interrupted if, if, you know, people get the right support and help, it all can change, you know, like, like, it's amazing how just starting to move in a different direction interrupts that problematic, it doesn't magically fix everything. And, you know, but, but you start to see shifts and, you know, I I mean, uh, recovery, you know, can heal and, and change not just the person who's in recovery, but the entire Mm -hmm. family, you know, so. And I just want to say, just to add, build on what Tammy said, that addiction really is a generational issue. So you might have some kids who come out of an addictive family and they're really rigid and they're very, you know, life can only be this way because they felt like things were so out of control when they grew up. And then oftentimes I hear the sad story, well, they're all sad stories, but my kid is drinking, my kid has, you know, um, is compulsively gambling or, you know, you abusing porn because the issues can come down to kids in, in many different ways. Uh, and I often tell ther- kids, I often tell parents whose kids are, you know, over 18, where you can't really affect their lives in a deep way, start saving for therapy because they're going to need it. Okay. okay. Next question. Yeah. And we've got a bunch. So Wife of a sex addict, 12 years, D-Day was 11 years ago, trickle disclosure over the years with no therapeutic disclosure yet, uh, because my husband is in and out of therapy and in and out of addictive patterns. So he's basically got zero recovery. I have a problem with setting a bottom line boundary. That's true of lots of partners, um, that it, that if he continues this way, I can't be with him in this marriage because every time I set boundaries to talk to him about my pain, he goes into shame, depression, and suicidal thoughts for weeks. And it normally takes makes his addiction worse, but also makes my the life for me and my kids unbearable. So I don't speak to him much about his addiction. How do I know the difference between manipulation of him not wanting me to bring this up or if this is real and how do I get past this? My CSET says I'm sacrificing my life for him. The problem is I'm so scared of the outcome of this kind of conversations. He did have once that he was halfway out the window and I told him, um, I will not go until he gets back inside. So I'm scared if he goes through with that. How do I there's it's, more. It's okay. I, I uh, have deal with the this. fear? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You are being manipulated. <laughs> Big mm-hmm. capital I M. I agree. Because, and here's why. I have lots of shame for my behavior, but why don't I feel ashamed when I'm seeing sex workers? Why don't I feel ashamed when I'm looking at porn every day? Why don't I feel ashamed when I went out during COVID and had sex with all these people and then went home to my family? That's where the shame lies. If you bring it up, all you're doing is reminding someone of what they already know. And besides, it's not fair for you to edit um, your feelings uh, and the reality of what you're going through to make somebody else feel okay. Um, Your job is to take care of you and your family. So, you know, if it were me, I, I would set different boundaries. I don't think the boundaries you're setting are helpful because this person knows how to manipulate you, um, obviously, because you're still questioning after a long time, whether you have the right to say what you need to say. You know, you are not responsible if your husband wants to jump out a window, that's up to him. But I will say this to you, your boundaries are not um, solid enough. If it were me, I would change the locks. I would tell this person, you know, I can't live with you anymore. Let me talk to a lawyer. Um, In other words, I would make more concrete and very clear words mean nothing now. And especially if you're being if if he or she's gotten you wrapped around their finger, because every time you bring up what makes you unhappy and makes you crazy, they go into I can't hear it again. If they can do what they do, then they can hear what you have to say. And if they can't hear what you have to say, then you need to take an action to protect yourself and your sanity. 
because this is uh, awful. And by the way, you have a professional in your life who sounds like knows what they're doing, who said to you, um, you're sacrificing your life for this person. And by the way, if you have kids, they are watching this. They are watching your manipulation, your unhappiness, your hopelessness. They are living with that. And by the way, when dad, I guess it's dad, gets depressed and ashamed and shuts down, your kids are watching that too. So if you can't protect yourself with more clear boundaries, if you are willing to sacrifice your life on the altar of someone else, at least protect your children. If you just look at it in terms of them, you understand that you need to take a more clear action um, than the one you're taking. So, um, Tammy? I go back to what Dr. Robbins said at the very beginning. Nothing you can do or not do is, is it affects him. It, it, I agree with Dr. Rob, 100% manipulation, because look what it does. It completely, like you avoid those conversations that he doesn't want to have. And 11 years right. later, he hasn't done anything to make your household safe for you and for your children. So, so um, what do you, the boundaries are for your safety. They're not punitive. They're not, you know, to scold him. And if the absolute worst happens, like if he does choose to kill himself, it's his choice ultimately. And I hate that, well, but, I, but, and it's horrible for your children, but it is never going to be your fault You've, you know, he's got, he's got opportunities. You have a CSAT. He, I'm sure he's got access to, you know, qualified help as well, choosing not to do it. So, and what and better therapy. way to manipulate you than by saying, and by the way, I have clients who threaten suicide. I have clients who have done things to indicate they're suicidal. But let me tell you, as a whole, addicts are far too narcissistic and tar far too self focus to ever truly hurt ourselves. I'm not tempting anyone to go do it, but let me just say this. If you, and it can be absolutely true, you may be with someone who is so pained, so ashamed, so hopeless that they don't want to live when these things are brought up. That's what residential treatment is for. That's what we do this for. If someone is unable to hear, even hear, no less be responsible for their behavior and they're putting it back, on you as a threat to their being alive, then that person needs to be in a safer environment to, where they're being monitored and supported and pierced in order to deal with this. And I have no problem taking someone into residential treatment who is suicidal or has great shame. That is the whole point of having a contained environment. And then you get to go to your therapy and work through your anger, your hurt, because what about your pain? And what do you have to keep stuffing that inside of you because you're worried about them? If you're worried about them, send them to us and we'll be glad to have a contained environment for them to begin to look at their shame and their desire to not live. That's why we are here. Let's move on. Okay. Yeah, I'm working on it. So um, how does the oh, IFS, so internal family systems model benefit the sex addict? I'm having issues with coming to grips with accepting that the parts all have good intentions, meaning that it seems like IFS takes the addict away from owning their behavior. So I would not use IFS, internal family systems at all period until someone was truly sober or working on it. There is only one form of therapy, research-based, that works with addicts. It is called cognitive behavioral therapy. That's what works. It, and the, how do I know that? Because there is no research that tells us, and there's been plenty of research on addiction, there is no research that tells us that there is any other form, whether it's analysis or Jungian or IFS or any, that is effective in the treatment of addiction. Now, if somebody has underlying issues like trauma that they are unable to work through without acting out, then that's what, again, what residential treatment is for people who are unable to gain sobriety on their own. But I want you to understand something about being a therapist. Our work by its own nature, asking someone to examine themselves and look at their past, is going to raise anxiety. So any form of therapy you take on is going to make someone uncomfortable and anxious. That's the nature of therapy. When you bring things up, they're uncomfortable, people get anxious. If you're using a different model, that person, and let me say it this way, if someone doesn't have the ability to put a foundation under their anxiety, their fears, their 
trauma, whatever, then they can't do that work until they have stability. How could I look at myself and my underlying issues and how the different parts of me relate to each other if I can't get sober, if I'm still doing the things that cause me to have shame, there's just not a place for this. Now in addiction treatment, I might say, you know, you've got this little kid inside who's banging around and asking for attention and you end up acting out over, yeah, I might use a piece of that toward addiction healing, but I would never take that on as a primary method when someone is really struggling with acting out um, either their trauma triggers them back into acting out, which means they need a, a more contained environment, or they're going barking up the wrong tree. And so I do agree with your frustration. It's a very good form of therapy for a whole bunch of things, but not when you're dealing with addiction directly. Or early on, I, you know, for, yeah. for the later work, you know, it's like the, like we have the attachment wounds and the inner child work but people need to start with sex addiction 101, porn addiction 101, and then they can start doing some of those other things after they've got a foundation, you know, on which to build. So it's the same as medical. Okay. Care. Next, you know, point. you don't, yeah, anyway, go ahead. You get it. Question regarding your reply to someone last week about abuse. Don't you consider that deceit, lies, gaslighting, darvo, cheating, betraying, blah, 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 are all abusive behaviors? Yes. Sure. The definition of abuse is to use or treat uh, so as to injure uh, or damage. I don't know about rape the person asked about, but isn't there something abusive or coercive about having sex with someone without full knowledge of what they're doing, including but not limited to them having unprotected sex with others, which may have resulted, I think they said okay, in pregnancy so or something. Okay, now I, now I can, I can take anyway, this yeah. on because Tammy and I absolutely talked about this last week. And so maybe, let me be very clear. The way some therapists are approaching the treatment of addiction is with an assumption that addicts are predators like criminals and sociopaths. And that is not my experience in doing 30 years of work. There certainly are some people, I think I would count on maybe this hand in 30 years, the number of maybe two <laughs> out of seeing literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in my doing this work that are really unredeemable. I've seen a couple of people who really should be in prison. But, but this whole concept of because I have been abusive to you, lied to you, it is abusive. It isn't okay. I am destroying your sense of self. It is deceitful and lying and all of that. But that doesn't mean I'm a sociopath. Every addict in their bloom of their addiction, whether it's an alcoholic or a gambler or a sex addict, is being abusive, is gaslighting, is cheating, is betraying and insulting every addict. But this concept that that sex addicts in particular are perpetrators and sociopaths, I, that doesn't make sense to me. Alcoholics are doing the same thing. Gamblers are doing the same things. We all lie and cheat in order to protect our addiction so that we can keep doing it. But when you say someone's a sociopath and is going to be a perpetrator for the rest of their lives, it doesn't leave room for hope. It doesn't leave room for healing. So yes, I think people can act in certain ways when they are really you know, screwed up by addiction, if you will. But that doesn't mean that's who they are. It means that's how they acted in order to protect their addiction. Um, so no, I don't think any of those behaviors are okay. And I do think they're abusive, but I don't think that that means that this person is anything until they've been evaluated and assessed and treated. And so I don't assume that A plus B equals C. I assume that A plus B equals a real problem that we have to examine. Um, so I don't like labels. Uh, addict is a good one, but I certainly don't believe in labeling people before they've really had a chance to demonstrate healing and responsibility. So um, there are two different things going on and both, and they are similar, but they are not directly the same. I don't know, Tammy, do you, can you clarify that? More? I do, because I love that this person said that the, the behaviors are abusive. Absolutely. But to make it you, that that person is abusive or is an abuser, that, that predatory, you know, sociopath, whatever the, those labels, because it, it feels like it comes then from the a person is doing it intentionally with, you know, with every, I, and I know to partners, it feels like they're doing it intentionally. And I agree with you that they are absolutely preserving their ability to act out because they don't know any other way in their brokenness. The behaviors are, you know, are absolutely abusive to themselves, to their relationship, to you, to everybody. And why it's so hurtful and why it blows my mind that people sit on the fence about, you know, getting help, you know, like you can have life differently. 
if you're willing, you know, if you're willing to step into it, but taking the hope out of, you know, cause then you're, I mean, if you're really an abuser, you are, you, you, you are, are a sociopath, you're always going to be that. Now, maybe you can learn to do things differently, but it keeps that relationship, you know, never as a partnership of working on healing together. So that's my, I, I want to add one thing tonight. Which sure. is, and I think Cammy would agree with this, that either end of the spectrum, if yes. the therapist or a professional thinks, oh, it's no big deal, you know, they're, they're just whatever, or it's a marital problem, you work it out, they're not doing their job. And anyone who's at this end, which is, says a person is unredeemable and there'll always be a perpetrator, they're not doing their job. And I'll tell you that I, and I'll just tell you very confidentially, <laughs> it's not really confidential, I have trained. Every single one of those therapists who are out there saying this, extensively trained, and I will tell you, and without naming any names, that they're angry people. They are holding their own issues inside, and they are directing their own unhappiness onto the person who has the problem. And I don't think those people have done enough self-examination to provide the kind of treatment that's required in this circumstance. You have to know yourself. You have a therapist who doesn't hasn't done a lot of work on themselves, they're going to play that out with their clients. And that's most often what I see when they really go after these people as being unredeemable. Uh, I just don't believe it in most cases. No, we've seen hey, too Tammy, many helpful Can cases. I run to the restroom yes. real quick? You know, I'm a little older and I, but I'll be Would right back. Would you please mute? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'll mute. <laughs> Thank you. My wife wants seem, seems to want perfection from me in my recovery. How is that possible when I'm far from perfect? It isn't possible. We're all humans. We're we're not we're not perfect in any way, shape, or form. Hopefully, um, as part of your recovery process, you are working the twelve steps, which gives you a means. You know, one through nine is cleaning up the wreckage of our past. 10, 11, 12 is taking care of the daily stuff. So, you know, if every day I'm doing my 10th step and I'm taking my, um, my evaluation, I have the opportunity to make amends wherever I need to. But, you know, I, I've been doing this a while. I'm sure as heck not perfect. Like there now, do I do my recovery perfectly? Uh, on one aspect? Yes. The alcohol and drugs. Absolutely. The eating disorder, that was a lot more of a challenge. And are there days I eat better than other days? Yes. Now, do I go into full blown, you know, whatever, but you know, I mean, so it's completely different, but to expect perfection. And I think it would, I think it would be interesting to have the conversation like in, not in a heated way, but to have a conversation, you know, of, and, and tell, tell me what you're looking for and tell me. You know, tell me where that's coming from, because I am confident that there's fear for, from her. You know, can I really trust that you're doing what you need to do to keep us safe? So what is it that you can do rather than, you know, then she wants perfection and I can't do that. And either throwing in the towel or getting angry at her, you know, having the dialogue of how can I support you? What is it that you're looking for from me? How can I show accountability? I'm human. I'm not going to be perfect in any, I mean, there's not one thing that we as humans do that is completely perfect, but how can I do the best I can? I love that our program is called seeking integrity. We seek integrity. We don't ever achieve a hundred percent perfection and integrity, you know, on this planet. So, so what do we do on a daily basis is work towards that clean up, you know, when we need to, you know, and continue to learn and grow. So hopefully that's helpful. What are your thoughts? Well, I wrote a whole book about this called out of the dog house, a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating. Um, I do think, and we teach a course in it. And I think, and, and let me put it this way. Um, a couple of things. Number one, um, I completely understand that as a spouse, once I get sober and I seem to be on the path, what you expect is now I'm going to be more relational, more engaged. I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to have empathy. I'm going to be the person you wanted me to be. And the answer is, you know, an asshole is an asshole. A sober asshole is a sober asshole. Excuse me, Tammy. Um, I need to learn a lot of skills in order to be emotionally available to you and, and sometimes even uh, not dismissive. My acting out was the leading way in which I avoided reality. But now that I'm in reality, as much as you deserve it and as much as you should have it, that doesn't mean I know how 
to treat you with compassion and kindness. You deserve it, but I'm just barely struggling with being a decent human being and telling the truth. It could be a while, a year or more before I, in therapy, in 12-step program, Ms. Tammy said, before I become a better person. Um, the reason I wrote out of the doghouse was because I have never met a man yet who understands how to even begin to heal uh, a cheating relationship with a woman, especially because he doesn't understand what she's going through. So I did, there is a course, there are books, it's not going to solve the problem, but he or she really needs to understand what the problem is. And as, as Tammy said, a lot of us don't even know what it is you want. Um, so, and then when we do, we don't know how to give it. So uh, it's, we feel like we have to be perfect because uh, now we feel like we, we, you do deserve all the things that we should give you, but we don't know how. And so we kind of dismiss it. So um, yes, partners want perfection. No, you will never be perfect, but you can be more compassionate, more engaged, more empathic um, so that your partner feels like you're on the right road. And I can tell you one evening of the right words and the right exchange will reduce a lot of that person's desire for you to be perfect because they will feel like there, there is progress. You may have some work to do on becoming more empathic and more respectful. Um, that you can learn. We teach it. <laughs> I wrote about it. Feel free. Yeah, the next Out of the Dog House, um, I think, starts um, early July. So the next Out of the Dog House work group. Okay, next question. As a sex and love addict, I really need to get myself organized for my safety and recovery. Are there good resources to help put together a good recovery plan with consequences selected by the addict for themselves and agreed on by the partner? Um, hmm. Well, I, I think that a good therapist who is trained in this work can put together a very clear schedule or organized structure that will tell you what is okay and wasn't what is not okay and when you need to do this and when you need to do that. I mean, that's our job and we're trained in it. But lacking that, I wanna go back to what Tammy said about 12 step programs, which is if you seek somebody who is not afraid to tell you, call you on your BS, if you are not afraid, if you're working with someone who you can, you're asking for, not ducking under or pretending it's okay, but really asking for their guidance, you know, ask them, what should I do in the evening when I come home? What do you do? What should I do when I come to a meeting and this and that? I think people who have what you want or people who you're paying to be guides should be able to give you very clear direction about what you need to do. Um, by the way, you can raise your hand at a 12-step meeting, and I assume you're going to lots of them, and say, I don't know how to be more accountable, more responsible, you know, more responsive. And I want to learn, are there people around who can help me? Go out for coffee after the meetings, now that we're meeting live again, and sit down with these folks and tell them what you're struggling with. The resources are all around you. It may well be that you're not fully listening or asking the right questions. Um, by the way, I do want to say that, and I, I know the partners won't like this, but I, as as a addict, I do not want my spouse to be my parole officer or my mother. I have a responsibility to you, my spouse, to let you know what acting out is and if I've crossed that line. But it is not your job to evaluate as a spouse when I look at someone and I find them attractive or I have some fantasy or I drive through the wrong neighborhood. That is for me to go to my sponsor, my program, my therapist and discuss. My job with you, the spouse, is if any bottom lines get crossed, you need to know immediately. Um, but every little thing that comes up, if I go to my spouse with that, things will never get better because they will constantly be provoked because we do often see someone attractive or look at the right, look at the wrong situation. You know, we do, we're not perfect. And I'm not saying we're acting out, but it is my responsibility to seek the support of others who are on the same road as me. And if things get if things come up that would truly hurt my spouse, I need to tell them. Um, I also think one more thing, and Tammy, we, we may not get to all the questions tonight, but I sure hope this is helpful. Um, one of the things that I ask anyone who's supporting an, another addict to do is when you call them and say, I am going to go act out, not I just act out, but you reach out to them before, which is your responsibility. That my job as a, someone who's guiding you is to say, well, I hear all the things you're excited about going to do, but how will you feel afterward? That's one of my favorite questions to ask an addict is they're so focused on the moment that's going to be so amazing and whatever, they forget that afterwards they're gonna worry that they have a disease and they're two hours late and they spent this money and they have to lie. And you know, so I think a good responsible 
person who's guiding you will really ask you to call before or reach out before texts texts are good and also to sit down and talk about what is going to happen after you do this um, to help you know shake you a little bit about what what's really going on okay so yeah and i read i'm trying to do this all by myself i need to get organized i need to figure this out i need to set the consequences and i'm going like mm -hmm. mm, disaster so i love that dr rob talked about professionals and sponsors and group you know i also put in the um chat the next sex addiction 101 work group is going to start that's a great place to get some guidance that you know they have a relapse prevention plan and you have the opportunity to talk that's to true. the you know other people in the group about you know i'm thinking about putting this here and this is what i, you know, I mean like great you know that and, and we have support sessions, 25 or 50 minute support sessions. We've had people bring their three circle plan and go over it with, you know, someone to discuss that specifically. Do I have the right things? You know, our best thinking got us here. So we need other people who have been, you know, are on the journey to help guide us. So, so I really hope you lean into the, to the support and guidance um, uh, and partners do have, you know, they, they do have some um, input on, you know, like if you break a bottom line, what is the consequence? They, you know, it may be a therapeutic you know, separation. You know, they do get to have some input on that. So, okay, next question. Dr. Rob has said that most couples who have been together for many years stay together. My perception is that the vast majority may stay married, but their marriage is sexless and a shell of what could or should be. And that the healing from the damage from betrayal is so rare that even the addict even if the addict is in recovery. What is your experience with this for couples when the addict has come to SI or in general? That is not okay, my experience. So, so well, yeah, I mean, I, I go would ahead. say yeah. um, a couple of things about this. Um, yeah. So I, if you take away the sex addiction um, as an addict, I have a much um, larger issue at, Play, which is I have trouble with intimacy. I can have sex with all the strangers in the world because I don't know them or an affair partner because they're not going to let me down or disappoint me. But sex with someone I'm as close to as a partner, to be honest with you, can be scary. Um, I think that there are, is a process toward gaining intimacy that doesn't start with penetrative sex. It starts with holding hands and going on dates. And, you know, when we talk in treatment about what is intimacy, we don't mention the word sex. What we talk about is revealing yourself, being honest, being vulnerable, and taking the steps toward connection. Um, so um, yes, I, and as a sex addict, I will tell you, I've been married for 20 years. And when I get in bed with my spouse, I would rather read the paper than have sex because um, it's something that I have to find my way to. I, I will say often to addicts that sex and recovery is more about willingness than horniness. You have to understand that our, our, uh, what made us turned on to have sex is so intense, so powerful to us, so much heart beating and adrenaline that we look at a spouse that we've been with for 10 years and we don't have that feeling. So how do we evolve sexuality as an addict without returning to that intensity? We have, it comes through holding hands and looking at each other's eyes and giving massages and talking. And guess what? I might get excited and guess what? We might have sex and guess what? It might be the best thing in the world, but it didn't come about through my looking at you like porn. Um, so I think there is a healing process for addicts to become more willing to be sexual and to understand different ways of being sexual than we have ever done before. It's different. The other thing is about, um, some, about the relationship. You're right. The relationship will never be the same. I will never ever look at you as a spouse and think that you have my back when you leave the house, that you absolutely are on my side because I know, know that you can go out in the world and deeply hurt me and do things that you know are gonna cause me pain and you do them anyway. Now I know that. So once the original trust in the relationship uh, and I would say sometimes naive trust has been destroyed, it will never come back in the same way. You know, you break a plate, plate you're gonna always see the crack when you glue it back together and it's the same Thing. But can you be deeper, more deeply intimate in, in ways that you've never been before? Can you be more open, more revealing, more trusting and have healthy sexuality? Yes. But that original naive trust that, that you will, whenever you're out in the world, you would never do anything to hurt me, that, that is gone. And the relationship will never be the same. It'll be different and it might be better, but it will never be the same. 
By the way, if you're so unhappy in a relationship, this might be a time for some couples therapy or some sex therapy or ways to work on this very issue. Um, yeah. Oh, there is one more thing. I, I, and maybe Tammy, you have had a different experience. We're about the same age, which I'm not going to tell them what that is, but I don't have sex with my spouse the way I did 20 years ago. You know, I'm older and I'm not as, not as uh, my hormones are not racing the way they did in the past. So I might give up that intensity based sex, which for me was like drinking. Um, you know, it was about completely obliterating my feelings and disappearing into something. But that doesn't mean I have a clue what healthy sexuality and intimacy might be. So anyway, that's my long response to that question. And, and I think, to me, being more deeply connected on a on an honest and vulnerable, you know, physical contact and whatever that comes from is meaningful. So, you know, like you said, it's not just about penetrative sex or giving up and going, well, we used to have that 20 years ago. And now, you know, you've, you've ruined all of that. I, I, I have too many couples that eyes wide open are finding, you know, a different path forward and it is more meaningful for them. So I honestly believe that there is hope and healing, you know, for those that, that choose it. So, okay. Next question. My PASA husband has been has for the last five years since discovery accuses me of all kinds of underhanded behavior, constantly accusing me of cheating. He goes into pretty descriptive sexual perverted things. He says, I'm doing no proof will oh. change his thinking. He says he doesn't need proof because he knows I am doing it. Just the other day, he called me at four because he told me someone told him uh, someone liked me in high school, which was over 40 years ago. What is going on here? It's abusive. Yeah, that is, like that almost makes me wonder if there's like mental health issues or something, don't you think? Bingo. Oh, so there okay. is a, a disorder, a psychological disorder that is, um, I have to look it up because I don't have it in front of me, but it's a delusional disorder and it's a fixed mm -hmm. delusion. So I might be in another arena. I might be absolutely convinced that, um, that something's going to happen if I do a certain thing. And no matter what you tell me, I believe that it's this way and I can't be talked out of it because it is part of my whole sense of self. So there is a jealous, I can't think of the name of it. Um, I have to type it in, but there is a, and what is a delusion? It's when you, when you think something is a particular way and it's just not true. And no matter what you say, that person cannot see it. So number one, it, it is a sound like a psychological and emotional problem that goes way beyond addiction. I agree with Tammy. This feels like a mental health problem and certainly some, something that um, should be evaluated in a, uh, with somebody who really knows what they're doing. Um, again, this is somebody who might be really do well in residential treatment, but someone who's reaching back to that past and calling you names like that in the present, they're disturbed. And I don't, I, God bless them. I hope that they do well, but you don't have to take that from them. In fact, I'll tell you a story years and years ago. Thank you, Tammy. She put in types of delusional disorder. Years Chanel, and years ago. A person with this type believes their spouse or sexual partner is unfaithful. It's in the DSM. And what is it called again? I'm Can sorry. you say? I didn't. No. It's a three types of uh, delusions and delusional disorders. There's Erotom, erotomanic, and I've got mm -hmm. it in there, grandiose and jealous. A person with this type believes their spouse or sexual partner is unfaithful. Yeah. I, I also, um, I've also seen, and this is really sad. Um, I had a person come into treatment many years ago. I, I sort of wanted to write this case up, whose spouse, in this case, it was a husband, had convinced her had been so abusive over so many years that she thought, well, maybe I did do these things and maybe he's right. I mean, she herself became crazy. And I actually saw her in treatment because I was doing outpatient and we were seeing women as well, I was. And um, I really thought, oh, she's a sex addict. She's doing all this stuff. And the more we went, the more I realized that what she was saying was, my husband told me this and my husband told me that. And over time, we call this craziness for two. There actually is mm. There actually is another diagnosis that says when you live with a crazy person long enough, you take on their craziness. And in the, that case, the woman was so 
devastated by this constant accusation that she was doing things that she wasn't doing that eventually she just thought, well, maybe I am. So I think your mental health is also at stake here. I think you're asking the right questions. But to, when you say no proof will change their thinking and their problem is escalating and they're calling me, this is someone who's really got some problems beyond sex addiction. And you know, I, if they're on here, I mean you no judgment. I really hope that you get some help because you're gonna lose your relationship over this. And as well, you should, because you can only drive somebody so crazy. Um, thank you for bringing that up, Tammy. Did you not, I mean, that's something that, I, that shocked me when I went to school. Isn't that a kind of an, uh, it's unusual to see that. Yeah, well, but it was just that the pattern and so insistent that you kind of go, that this is, I mean, because especially in the light of proof that to the contrary, right. you know, that is so fixated. So I'm Delusions really Delusions are a so. fixed and unchanging belief um, that isn't true. Okay, next question. And I know we're on um, borrowed time for you. Okay, got, hi guys, thanks for the service. I am currently seeing a psychotherapist that deals in addiction, but not specifically with sex addiction. As a recovering PA, I attend 12 step as well as group therapy for sex addiction. My therapist doesn't specialize in that essay, but I've gotten a lot out of our sessions. And so far, my best experience with therapy today will not be seeing it. Well, not seeing a CSAT hurt my recovery. Well, I think it's really important to have someone that you trust and you think is useful um, and that you can lean on is meaningful. I would never want to take that away from you. But I think, and also it, it is absolutely true that you cannot see two therapists at the same time because one person tells you this and one person tells you that, and then what the heck do you do? However, therapy can be additive. In other words, maybe there's someone who's doing group therapy in your community with sex addicts. So you can see your therapist individually and then go get, excuse my language, knocked around, battered a little bit in your group therapy. And then you go back to your therapist and say, wow, that was really hard. I had to do disclosure. I had to do this and that. And your therapist can support you. Um, we teach courses. There are all kinds of things. You go to treatment, all kinds of things you can do that are additive rather than I have to go from this person to that person. There were times when I was working with a client who had a therapist that they appreciated and valued. And I would call that therapist with permission, you know, obviously release and say, would it be okay if I work with your client for six weeks and just kind of help set them on the right path and then you know, send them back to you or have you see them at the same time? So I can, I used to say this, do the dirty work. I can do the hard stuff. I can be the bad guy, if you will. And then, you know, rules, structure, challenging, and then they can go back and work with you and deal with the feelings they have about that. So while you cannot see a therapist uh, uh, for the long-term individually, you can use another therapist as a consultant or a guide for a specific period of time. You certainly can go to group therapy for sex addicts forever and also see your individual therapist. Um, but the bottom line is, if you are continuing to act out, and I didn't, uh, you know, first of all, you can- I don't read it. that, yeah, so go ahead. So here's a thought for you. Um, and I, you know, if you're really struggling and you want more help, go see your therapist twice a week. It, go, to, go to four meetings a week instead of two. Up the ante on the work that you're already doing and see if that makes a difference. Um, yeah, that's my best answer. Well, and I put in, because you, you mentioned sex addiction, but you said as a recovering porn addict. So I put the link for the Porn Addiction 101 that starts on June 18th. And that is not in place of working with a therapist. I have CSAT trained therapists that send their clients to those because, um, because the information that you gather, then you take that back and work with your therapist. Your therapist gets addiction. You know, like you may be able to supplement like with those work groups and things and be able to bring back information that you need to work on specifically with your therapist. So so that might be another way to supplement like Dr. Rob was talking about as well. Tammy, let's answer the next question and then let you guys know I'm going to okay. leave just a few minutes early because tonight in your time zone, uh, you know, um, A&E um, is presenting a show called uh, Addiction, sorry, Digital, Digital. Addiction. And I've had the opportunity, Arts and Entertainment Network, and I've had the opportunity to do some shows with them and try to, well, it's a documentary, and uh, try to support some of these people. And so tonight is one of the nights I think one of my shows is going to air. So I will cut up just no, a minute. No, I'm going to clarify. It's the premiere of the show, and you are one of the experts on it. So it's not just like, oh, you're, no, this is the premiere of, the, of this show. So anyway. Well, Tammy, okay. it sounds like you're proud of me. 
I am. No, I like raising awareness. I mean, there's, there's so much misinformation out there. So, right. and I'm hopeful. I, you know, I have binge watched intervention shows and I'm sitting there going, no, get out, get out, you know? So, so I always want people to get recovery. And so if this helps bring healing and education and information, there's so many people out there that post, you know, and they've got no background in this. So having you that have decades of experience have done this work, you know, to be able to help carry a message, I think is good and meaningful. So, okay. And I think so they got the, that. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Last question. Um, I, I have just discovered concerning. my husband and partner of 11 years has been a sex addict for our entire relationship. I don't know where to begin. I'm concerned about my pubescent daughter, even to be around my husband anymore. He has a history of corruption of minor. Uh, he has a history of corruption of a minor as well. What do I do? Okay. I don't know what corruption, corruption of a minor means, but I have a feeling it's not a good thing. Um, and you know, one of the questions I would ask myself, since I don't know what you mean uh, directly, but let me say this. If, uh, if this behavior was known by uh, police, would they come over and arrest him? Would they be? In other words, I think if you're not sure what, how bad it is, think about, well, if someone else in a position of authority were to know about this, what would they do? So in any case, to answer your question, sex addict or not, First of all, most sex addicts, if not nearly all, are not perpetrators. I have, again, I've run into certainly people who looked at the wrong images online, for sure. I have worked with people, not worked with a lot of people as sex addicts with hands on the fence. Some do. So if there's a history, I worry. The reason I'm saying these two things is a lot of you spouses think, oh my God, if they're doing this out of control sexual behavior, what about my kids? And the answer is that would be very unusual. I don't, there is a there is a meaningful difference between compulsive and addictive sexual behavior and sexual offending. However, um, there are sex offenders who have patterns of compulsive sexual behavior. And if someone, so I agree with you, I would be concerned. Um, I would probably begin by talking to my daughter about what is safe and what is not. I would probably be concerned about, you know, showers and bathtubs and putting her to bed and all of those kinds. I mean, I think your concern is, is very, um, very well, uh, I think it's meaningful considering what you see. Um, the what do I do thing, you know, I, I really, the first thing I think of is go see a professional who can help guide you and make decisions. I would not want to be stuck in this situation alone. I don't think that a partner's group or going to a 12-step program is enough for the situation. I really, really, really think you need professional guidance. And we are trained, hopefully, to know what to do in a situation like this. Um, and I would ask Tammy for a referral. By the way, if you don't have the resources or the money, you don't have to see someone forever. You can say, I'm going to see someone three or four times to get a sense of what I'm dealing with and how I should deal with it. Tammy is T A M I at seekingintegrity.com. And Tammy is such a great resource for uh, therapists, for things to read, for, you know, we'll be glad to help you find someone where you live who can help you evaluate the situation. I wouldn't want to be alone in this one. And I'm so, so glad you're here to bring up these questions. Um, Tammy? No, I, I agree. I just uh, typed in my um, uh, email address. Yeah, and, and you can, on either of our sites, you will also... If you register, you will get to me. So you will get an email with resources. Um, but, you know, people sometimes just sign up for that so that they get the email. Sometimes people are sharing, this is what's going on. So um, I try to do my best to answer and give relevant um, resources for you. So And Tammy, I have to say, okay. before I say, everyone loves you. I have to say, when I do these consultations, that everyone, especially the spouses, but I often hear, God, Tammy was such a great guide, or Tammy gave me so much information. She's really hung in there with me. Or like you said, he, she answered all my emails and it was overwhelming. I really value, and I want to say this in front of everyone, the amount mm -hmm. of time and care that you give for these folks. Because tonight there are 45 people on here. I can only imagine how many calls, how much email you get. So thank you for doing that. I really thank value you. it. And so do they. And they tell me. So oh, I appreciate have that. A, thank you. So you all have a good night. Um, I'll hopefully not be too scared after I see myself on TV to come back. And, uh, you know, it's all good. Just pretend you're watching an alter ego and it's all fine. I am. So, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Thank good you, night, everyone. Folks.
We'll Bye-bye. see you. people the treatment. I'll see you tomorrow.